God tonight. I want to continue uh, with our study and uh, looking at the types of the church, uh, the parallel of historical Israel, and uh, the gospel day. So we're going to begin tonight. We want to. We're going to title this study tonight. It'll be called the Restoration of the Altar. Restoration of the Altar. So just to kind of recap, last week we talked about how historical Israel uh, received uh, a decree by the king of Persia, Cyrus, who was prophesied of by Isaiah, uh, to go and to rebuild the temple, uh, which was in Jerusalem. And they began, the children of Israel began to make their way back, or some of the children of Israel began uh, to make their way back and to rebuild the temple. We're not there yet. We're simply looking at the fact that they were allowed under decree uh, to go back, and that was a glimmer of hope, a glimmer of light uh, for the children of Israel who had been in captivity for approximately 70 years. We looked at the Gospel Day and how there was 1,260 years of papal night that had ruled over the land. The people of God had gone into an apostasy back in the year 270. And from approximately, you know, one of the things about dates is I don't like to say this was the exact day or the exact time. We use these dates mainly as approximates of what was going on. So in around 270 uh, to the year 1530, people of God were dwelling uh, in darkness. The church, while it did exist, was not a visible uh, body. It existed. God still had a people, but it was under the thick darkness of Roman Catholicism uh, that it operated. We talked a little bit about that and that apostasy. And we talked a little bit about Martin Luther and how God revealed to him that the just shall live by faith and how he began to understand that it was on the merits of Christ and his righteousness uh, that we are able to be saved. And that is just the same today. It is only on the merits of Christ is one able to get saved and to stay saved. And so there was a glimmer of light that began to shine, and we call that one-third light. Uh, that will become more apparent as to why we call it that, uh, even in the study tonight. And we want to prove that to you by the word of God by God's help. So as we get started tonight, we're going to start with a word of prayer and ask God to help us as we look into his word. Heavenly Father, we're grateful. We're thankful for your goodness to us that has brought us to this point. Father, we need your help tonight once again. Lord, we cannot convey or, uh, dear Father, dear God, present anything, dear Lord, that is of lasting value except your spirit. Anoint, except your spirit bless tonight. So Lord, we pray that you would take every word that is spoken. And dear Father, dear God, may it be to edification tonight. We pray you would anoint it afresh. Dear Father, may we feel the very inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And dear Father, my God, take new courage. And dear Lord, to see that God has always had a people. That God always will have a people. And that if we will honor God, God will honor us. And so we just pray that you'll help us tonight. And we'll give you all the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So we want to start off, we actually uh, looked at these scriptures last week and drew a little different thought from them, but we also want to bring out another aspect to start our study tonight. So we invite your attention to the second chapter of the book of Ezra. We're going to look at historical Israel a long way back, kind of the overarching theme of this coming out of Babylon and coming back to Jerusalem. It was a long way back, and we want to look at the restoration of the altars to remind you um, that the Temple of Solomon was burned down and destroyed when they went into captivity. And so on, when they go back to Jerusalem, they are commissioned by King Cyrus under the direction of Governor Zerubbabel to rebuild the temple. And we want to just draw a thought here from Ezra chapter 2, verse number 61. And it says, And of the children of the priests... The children of Habiah, the children of Koz, the children of Barzillai, which took a wife of the daughters of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and was called after their name. These sought their register 
among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore, they were, therefore were they as polluted or as corrupt, put from the priesthood. Just a few thoughts we'd like to draw from this as we get started with the study tonight. Uh, the purpose of the genealogies in the Bible and the reason why the Jewish culture took such meticulous account of genealogies was so that it could be known of what tribe and family the Messiah would be born. And they felt that this was extremely important to be able to trace uh, their lineage to Christ or to the Messiah. And if the lineage was corrupted or messed up in any way, if that lineage could not be traced to Christ, then that tribe or those people that were not in the registry, their names that were not found in the registry, uh, were not, you know, they were as polluted. They could not operate in the priesthood. And so, as we even don't want to jump ahead too far here, but even in the gospel day in the church, our lineage must trace back to Christ. In historical Israel, their line must trace to Christ or to the Messiah. But the thought being here is that all that we are and all that we do must trace back to Christ. And Christ is the head of the church. Christ uh, is to be, uh, God wanted to be uh, the object of worship of his people. He said, I am a jealous God. And this had to be uh, of the bloodline of Christ, to be born a Jew, to be born into the kingdom of God. And if your name was not found in the registry, if your name was not found in the book, then you were considered as polluted and not of the church of God or of the people of God. Uh, they were of a foreign lineage. And even if maybe they weren't, but they couldn't be found in the registry for whatever reason. Uh, probably likely in this case, this priest looked like he... Uh, married a Gileadite who was not an Israelite, and he took on her name, her last name, while he was down in Babylon, and therefore this man was considered as being polluted. He was a foreign, it was of a foreign lineage, or he brought, bringing in a foreign element uh, into the kingdom of God. And as the people of God began to leave Babylon, uh, there were those among them that had been tainted by Babylon. As we just read here, here in verse 61, this priest, uh, he married one of the wife of the daughters of Barzillai, the Gileadite, they were tainted. They were corrupt. And when you come out of Babylon, God is not looking for anyone to bring Babylon with them. Uh, God is not looking for anybody to uh, bring taints and elements of Babylon into um, uh, among his people. All the foreign substances, all the foreign influences need to be left behind. And there were some among them that had been tainted and they wanted to come. And they still wanted to be a part. But their lineage was no longer... In the record is anyways, it was no longer connected to Christ. And as a result, they were put. The Bible says they were put from the priesthood. They weren't allowed to operate. Yet they still wanted to be a part of the priesthood. They tried. But thank God there were some ministers that did not allow that to happen. There were some priests that said, nope, your name is not in the registry. And God is only going to accept those who have a pure connection to Christ, that have an experience of Jesus Christ down in their soul, amen, that have been washed from their sins, and that is the only way to become a part of the beautiful church of God. We want to deal a little bit with uh, the aftermath of this Protestant Rep Reformation, so we want to keep that in mind, uh, that there were those that were trying to operate as they came out of Babylon, and they were polluted or corrupt. We want to keep that thought in mind as we look into the gospel day. And we want to jump into that part right now and kind of uh, take this in a piece by piece uh, method tonight. Revelation chapter 8, please. Revelation chapter 8. There were some priests that were put from the priesthood because their line did not trace back to Christ because they were not found in the registry. Revelation chapter 8, verse number 10. We want to deal with a few thoughts here tonight. And while we're looking, this is a parallel study, so we're not necessarily looking at the trumpets or the horses or uh, the seals. But we are going to take pieces of those tonight and try to explain those the best way we can in order to get a clear picture of what's going on. Revelation chapter 8, verse number 10. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, 
And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And if we could deal with a little, if we could deal in a little more detail, if we had time tonight with this third part, uh, we would. But a uh, third part can be used in a dual sense. But in many instances, the third part has to do with a conflict of sorts. And it usually has to be dealing with a conflict of evil. And if we had time uh, to really get delve into the scriptures with that tonight, we would. Uh, but as of right now, we're going to leave it at that to get the thought. But one of the things I want us to notice is that there fell a great star. So we know that before the great star fell, it was it was not it wasn't falling. At one time, it was shining. It was uh, used as a light, and it was a great star. And that great star, which at one time was shining, and we know the stars, it was burning as a lamp. If we were if we were to skip over to go back to Revelation chapter one, verse number sixteen. It says, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. These stars in Christ's hands, we know that those are the ministers, if we, the ministry of God. If we went down to Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels, are the angels or the messengers or the ministry of the seven churches and so bible students are well aware of that term angels uh, representing the ministry and so we know that this great star it fell meaning at one time it was in god's right hand but we know that stars are not infallible and we we know that by experience we've seen many ministers go down you've seen many ministers that have preached a solid message at one time and could be helped and could be blessed by their anointed messages, but just because one was anointed does not mean that they remain anointed. Just because a ministry or a minister or a group of ministers at one time have a good message, have an anointed message, does not mean that they still have that today. Amen. And so we know that these great stars, they can fall. And we've seen great stars fall and we've read of great stars falling and no one is infallible. No one is immune. Uh, to 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 falling minister no minister does not matter the devil does not care he, and he uh, takes great pride in being able to take down men of influence and so what we're getting a picture of here is a is a ministry that began with a great message they began with a mighty message they began with a with a message of justification that the just shall live by faith and Martin Luther and his uh, con contemporaries, they had a powerful message, and that message was burning as a lamp. It was sending light across the uh, across the country of Germany and beyond, and people were beginning to see the uh, the error that was in Catholicism, and that there was power in a justified experience, an experience with God, being made a new creature, being forgiven of your sins, not by uh, paying money, not by confessing to a priest but by simply taking of the free gift of Jesus Christ, meeting the conditions, realizing that I have nothing good to offer. Uh, there is nothing I can do to pay for the penalty of sin, and but I must offer myself to God and ask for forgiveness. And as a free gift, God gives us the gift of justification. God gives us the gift of salvation. We cannot do anything to make ourselves worthy of it, but it's grace that is freely given. And Martin Luther begins to proclaim this message, and it begins to do some damage uh, to the system of Catholicism. People began to leave Catholicism and take their stand, and revival breaks out through Germany and across Europe, and we have uh, uh, political forces being brought to their knees by this message because this light of truth is beginning to do some great damage, and it doesn't take much truth to begin to undo error. And if you walk in the truth, and if you walk in that light, God will undo all the error. Uh, unfortunately, though, we see that this great star that was shining and that was burning as a lamp did not continue to do so. Uh, this burning as a lamp represents uh, the anointing of the Holy Spirit on that message. The message is we could we could turn over. We did last week in Romans chapter one, verse seventeen. The message was justification that the the just shall live by faith. And I think a lot of times we uh, hear that term and we can almost take it for granted, but that's a powerful message, is that the message of, uh, of salvation, the message of justification, 
uh, that God has get, sent his son into the world to die on the cross, that if we uh, will avail ourselves to the blood of Jesus Christ that is freely given by meeting the conditions of repenting of our sins, uh, that God will, uh, based on the merits of the blood of Jesus Christ, freely forgive one of their sins. And that message was going forth. And as we, uh, if we were to go over to read in Revelation 3, verse 16, he tells the church in Pergamos, he says, Repent, or I'm going to fight against thee. I will come against thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And Christ is fighting back. He's fighting back against that system of Catholicism, this apostasy with what? The sword of his mouth, with the word of God. Fighting back with the Romans 117, that simple little scripture there with a powerful message began to do some great damage uh, to these systems of men that were working uh, and that had had power and control um, for for centuries. And that message, the word of God, began to fight back against them. And God began to rise up with his ministry and said it dealt the beast a deadly wound. We'll deal a little more with that as we move on. This is a picture. It says the scripture. Let's go back to Revelation here. Chapter 8. Read verse number 10 to get the picture here. And the third angel sounded. And there fell a great star from heaven. Or this is a picture of a ministry that is losing their position with God. This is a picture of a ministry that is losing their position with God. And so how, however beautifully that movement, that revival, that reformation started. That Protestant Reformation started started off so well, started off so wonderfully, so so gloriously. Unfortunately, they did not walk in the light. They did not hold on to the light and continue to walk in the light, and they began uh, to fall. And they did not continue to take the truth of God's word. If we were to go over to Jude, uh, verse 3, actually, I think it might be verse 23 that I want. Let's go turn over there. If I can find the verse. Actually, I want verse 13. Typo there. Jude chapter 1, verse 13 says, Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars. And you start to wander, you begin to fall. And so this Protestant Reformation started off as a great star, shining light on uh, the truth of God's eternal word, the message of justification. And they fell from Christ's right hand. You Begin wandering, you begin to fall, and they fell. And the Bible talks about the rivers. Revelation chapter 8, go back to our text here. Break this down. Burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers. And so we want to deal just briefly with the rivers tonight. Uh, if we were to go to Psalm 36, verse 8, talks about the rivers of thy pleasures. And... Uh, Verse Isaiah 48, verse 18 says, if they, basically, if they had obeyed, if, they had, if the children of Israel had hearkened unto the word of God, their peace would have been as a river. Isaiah 9, 6 talks about, in talking about the Messiah to come, talks about him being the Prince of Peace. Uh, let's go to, let's read the scripture over here. We have a few other references if you wanted to study a little more of the rivers. John 14, 27 and Roman 14, 17, dealing with peace. Dealing with the rivers of life, but John chapter 17, we want to, I believe, will be sufficient to clearly illustrate the thought that we're presenting tonight. John chapter 7, verse number 37 says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly, shall flow rivers of living waters. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. And so rivers are uh, have to do with peace, and rivers are a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And so when the stars fell, when this ministry fell, it began to have an effect on ex people's experiences. It began to have an effect on people's experiences. People who were holding to the Spirit of God, who were trying to walk in the light of the Spirit, when those stars fell, 
It fell on the rivers, and this will have an effect. Let's go back to Revelation 8. It said it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And we want to deal with that in a moment. We want to deal with this one thought here real quick. When the stars fell, when these ministers fell, it affected the people. And your ministry will have a direct effect one way or another on the people. As the priests go, so goes the people. Amen. And so uh, the ministry is responsible to feed the flock. But when they begin to taint the gospel, and when the ministry begins to not sound forth the whole counsel of God, it's going to have an effect on those that sit under that ministry. Amen. People are not exempt. And some people believe that they can just uh, they can just sit under a, 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 an apostate or compromised ministry and not be affected. And that is not so. Eventually, it will have its effect. And people today are in a, in a terrible spiritual state uh, across this land uh, because... Uh, they have not been fed the pure gospel. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of ignorance in the land today. There's a lot of a lack. There's a gross lack of spirituality in many instances, and it is the result of a ministry that has not sounded forth the gospel. Whatever is preached is what the people will believe. Amen. What is not strongly preached, what is not strongly sounded from the pulpit, will not strongly be will not be strongly believed. If you don't strongly preach against the world, then you can fully expect to have some worldly folks in the congregation. If you don't strongly preach on faith or, the, or, or inspire faith, you're going to have a faithless people. If you don't preach sanctification, don't expect to have a sanctified people. The people are the result of the message. Amen. And the message must be preached under the anointing and inspiration of the Holy Ghost in order to yield any results. And when it is not, it still yields results. It just yields the wrong kind. Amen. And so when this ministry sounded out the message of justification, many people received that message and forsook uh, the falsities that were in the Catholic Church and took a stand against that thing. Amen. And got an experience of uh, got the born again experience. But eventually that star did not continue to sound forth the message that the Holy Ghost wanted them to sound. And they began to taint the message and begin to come up with men's ideas and creeds and arguing about this doctrine and this scripture and should they hold to this part of the Catholic Church and should they hold on to this uh, doctrine that had been taught for years and you had uh, Calvinism come up with pre Cal John Calvin uh, begin sounding forth uh, on uh, predestination and then Luther and Calvin begin to go back and forth and they lost sight of the of of what had brought them out which was the Holy Ghost which was the inspiration of the Holy Ghost and they began to put a lot of men's ideas and a lot of men's opinions. In there, and the, again, the leadership of the Holy Ghost was substituted uh, with man's ideas and man's opinions. And that reformation that started off so gloriously and so bright and was shining light, it fell. It fell. And let's read on here to get a picture of this. So it says, and many men, uh, sorry, in verse number 10, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers. Rivers meaning uh, people that had that were walking in the light of the holy ghost that were under the that had the influence of the holy spirit in their lives but when this star fell it fell upon the third part of the rivers and it had effect and upon the fountains and upon the fountains of waters and so let's deal with this we went from rivers and we see another term here uh, that says waters so rivers or experience the experiences of salvation but wormwood set in if we go down to verse number 11 it says and the name of the star is called wormwood and if you do a study of wormwood and we'll see a few scriptures tonight that we can reference uh, but when wormwood sets in it is a result of the falling ministry it's a result of, of a ministry that has not sounded forth under the anointing of the holy ghost wormwood and bitterness are two words that are essentially synonymous throughout the Bible. And that word bitterness in the Bible really just means corruption. And so that means there was some corruption in the message. They were no longer a spiritual people. They no longer were holding to their experiences of salvation because of the effect of this star that fell upon the waters. They were fleshly. 
they were waters. And if we go to Revelation 17, 15, it tells us that the waters are people. They weren't spiritual individuals anymore. They were just fleshly. They were earthly. They were people again. They were operating in the flesh. They were they were uh, ministering in the flesh. And as a result, the people were getting in the flesh. And when men, when, as we say, as we have said, whenever ministry goes down, it will have a direct impact on the people. Let's look at this fountains of water. Water represents people. If you go and turn to Revelation 17, 15, it says the waters are people. Fountains of water are the source of water. And so these fountains are a picture of a ministry that brought the message, but this message was not from the right source. Fountains in the plural is no good. You want the fountain in the singular. Fountain in the singular is Christ. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 13. And I believe fountains as sources of ministers so accurately depicts the situation of Protestantism. You had one denomination after another from 1530 to 1880, just one right after the other. Different ministers, different sources, different creeds, different denomination, denominations uh, were set up over and over again. Usually uh, one denomination uh, was doing okay for a little while, had a revival or whatever. People were getting saved. They had the right message, and then they begin to fall into comrade. So another denomination pops up and rises up against that one, and then they begin to fall into the same pattern. And then you have maybe a disagreement on uh, uh, how the ordinances should be administered. So you have another sect start up over here, and you so you have Annie, Anabaptists, you have Baptists, you have Methodists, you have... Uh, uh, Wine Brenarians, United Brethren, Trinitarians, and uh, all of these different denominations begin to pop up, and all these different ministers uh, with different ideas uh, begin to arise during this time. And so they were not connected to the right source. Uh, let's go to uh, Zechariah chapter 13, verse number one. It says, In that day there shall be a fountain opened. To the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. If we were to go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 20, it talks about Christ uh, and the living water. We could also go over to John 19, 34, talking about, let's go over to John 19. We'll read that scripture. Uh, John chapter 19 and verse number 34. It says, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. There was a fountain open that day in the house of David. Amen. Jesus Christ, that fountain, he's the, the, the fountain in the singular is Jesus Christ. But in our text in Revelation chapter eight, it talks about fountains, it talks about fountains in the plural. And that is not Christ because there's only one Christ. Amen. And they were not producing a message. Uh, of a ministry that was connected to Christ. It says that a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp, it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called wormwood or bitterness or corruption. And the third part of the waters of all things, it became it became what the fall, uh, what the name of the star was called. It became wormwood, or they became corrupt, and many men died of the waters, or they lost, they lost um, their their experience with the Holy Ghost. They lost their experiences as a result of that fallen star. The great star was the ministry that initiated the Reformation in the 16th century. Fountains of waters are the ministry affected by the fall. And that ministry produced Protestantism and its many fountains or its many sects. When the star fell on the fountains of water, instead of preaching real salvation, they began to promote uh, their, their sect. They began to promote their group or their religious denomination. And they became corrupt or bitter. They became sectarian. And they actually became downright intolerant. So unless uh, you con uh, unless you conformed uh, to their creeds and to their rights, they would not accept you. They would not accept you as a Christian. The only problem is, is that their creeds that they had come up with were man-made 
and did not have a basis in the Bible. They began, they, they ceased to preach the sweet message of salvation, the sweet message of deliverance from sin, and they corrupted that message with the bitterness, wormwood or bitterness. And the Bible uh, definitely connects wormwood and bitterness throughout her. Proverbs 5, 4 says that her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword in Proverbs 5, 4. Jeremiah 9, 15 refers to, refers to feeding this people with wormwood. Lamentations 3.15 says, He hath filled me with bitterness. He hath made me drunken with wormwood. Amos 5.7 talks about ye who turn judgment to wormwood and leave off righteousness in the earth. So we get a picture here of a ministry that started off well. The glorious reformation with the glorious message of justification. Not walking in the light. Of the Spirit of God and a ministry that fell from its from its position and being in the right hand of God, they became wandering stars and they fell, and it had a direct impact on the people. And these fountains, instead of there being one fountain and one church and one body of Christ, the fountains produce sectarianism, and we have a situation where the people of God are being divided up into different denominations uh, throughout the world. To get a picture of this next part, we're actually going to flip back to the raising up of the altar. And so we want to we wanted to finish up that portion of the Protestant Reformation under Luther and look at the Wesleyan era. And we're going to get that picture by going back to the historical Israel uh, and looking at that first. And then we'll look at its parallel in the gospel day. Ezra chapter three. Ezra chapter three. Kind of in a transition here. So Ezra chapter three. Verse number one. And when the seventh month was come and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, and his brethren, and builded the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon as it is written in the law of Moses the man of God and they set the altar upon his bases for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries and they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord even burnt offerings morning and evening so the people of God uh, who decided to leave Babylon and go back to Jerusalem to build the temple of God they began by building uh, they come uh, and they, 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 they're, they're back in Jerusalem and they began by building the altar. And so God raised up some faithful men in the priesthood. It talks about those faithful men in verse number two. And they uh, took on the task of building the altar and getting back to sacrifices being on the altar as it was written in the law of Moses. Or they're going, they're building according to the pattern that was set for them uh, by Moses. They're not trying to do anything new. They're not trying to do anything different. They're going back to the pattern. And if God is going to have a church today in any time period, if he's going to have a people, they're going to have to build according to the pattern. And so God is raising up a ministry uh, that will set the altar back in order. It's not good enough to just come back from Babylon and be in Jerusalem and hang out. But you got to get to work. And there is a work for each time. And there is a work for each ministry. And there is a work for each people to do. Amen. We thank God for those who took a stand uh, out of Babylon and came out and amen and, 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 and heralded the message of justification. Amen. But God has more. We have to continue to walk in the light. And if we don't continue to walk in the light, we will go into darkness. And so we see one of the first things that they're doing as they come as they come back to uh, Jerusalem. It's not good enough to just be in Jerusalem, but there is a restoration. There is a work. That needed to be done during this time. And so the priests began to build the altar. And they began to raise it up. And the only protection that anyone has from the enemy is to get on the altar. Amen. To get back to being on the altar. And we see even at the dedication of the temple. Uh, when Solomon dedicated that temple, there was a, some sacrificing. Uh, there was a lot of sacrificing that was going on in that altar. And so we see that as they come back from Jerusalem. Uh, they see the necessity of getting the 
the sacrifices back and getting back to the level of consecration and selling out to God and amen and and, and getting things uh, back in order. Amen. So we go down to Ezra chapter three, we're in Ezra three, but verse number four, it says they kept also the feast of tabernacles, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number, according to the custom as the duty of every day required. They weren't trying to cut corners. They weren't trying to uh, skirt their responsibilities. Amen. But they're going back. Amen. And they're trying to restore the temple back to the pattern that Moses had set forth many years before. And afterward offered the continual burnt offering, both of the new moons and of all the set feasts of the Lord that were consecrated and of everyone that willingly offered a free will offering unto the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid, meaning the work was not done. Amen. Just because they had come back and they had gotten the sacrifices in order and they're keeping the feast of the tabernacles, the work wasn't done. Uh, the foundation was not yet laid. It was not it was not ready uh, for for there. There was not a complete restoration uh, that was done. But you must build on a proper foundation in order uh, to get proper results. Amen. And so while there was an aspect of. Of restoration completed here we do not see uh, the work being completed yet amen there's some good things happening there's some glorious things happening amen they're they're out of Babylon by a mighty hand of God by a decree of an old Persian king amen they've made their way there's some light shining they've got the altar built they're offering sacrifices on the altar amen but I also want us to see tonight that restoration does not happen overnight Amen. There is a process. Amen. You don't just go into apostasy and then one day snap your fingers and everything's back in order like it should be. Amen. Those, amen, when 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 God is trying to restore and when God is trying to do a work, oftentimes it takes time. Amen. It takes time. Amen. And that is the devastating, uh, that is the devastating impact of an apostasy. Amen. The generation that goes into an apostasy will never come out of it. The generation that goes into an apostasy will not come out of it. Amen. It is unlikely. It will never happen. Amen. Even take it in the gospel day. Amen. That apostasy, if we were to just take 270, say, hey, boom, 270 went into apostasy. Amen. Nobody from 270 ever saw the church of God be restored. Amen. That's the devastating impact of an apostasy. Restoration does not just come overnight. But God needs a people so that he can open their eyes. Amen. So that he can work with them. Amen. And in step by step, God will restore. But it does take time. We don't have a full temple just like that. We do not have a complete restoration of the temple of God. But we see the steps being taken. Amen. To restore some elements uh, that had been lost during that time. If we had time, we would go over to Leviticus 23. We're not going to do so uh, in this study. But talk a little bit about the Feast of Tabernacles and what that altar uh, being built. Um, look like, but we'll we'll just summarize it here. Um, how they how that altar represented uh, a twofold element. One is that it was consecration uh, or a selling out to God, and also it represents communion uh, with God. And we know that even if we were to study the tabernacle, the golden altar is a dual symbol. Uh, we use that uh, as the application of blood. Uh, to enter into the holiest as a type of sanctification. But that altar is also known as the altar of incense, uh, where uh, and, and we know that incense is the prayers of saints, which is communion with God. Amen. So what is being restored here is this element of consecration, as well as a communion with God, a people that are consecrated and communing with God on a consistent basis. Uh, this typified a complete consecration. It typified an experience of complete communion with God. And so during the seven days, for instance, of the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, God and his people rejoiced and they feasted together. Uh, and it was showing that holy communion uh, existed between God and his people. And to anyone that will open their heart's door to God and, 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 and sup with him and feast with him, amen, God will be with him. Uh, this, express, this expressed a relationship between God and his people in its highest form, and it is this uns, uh, it is this intercourse 
uh, that God has always craved with his creation. Uh, and this had been shut away because of their sinfulness. And that's exactly what happens with an apostasy is that people begin to lose uh, their individual connection with God. And unfortunately, uh, their connection becomes to a minister or their connection becomes to a, a group of ministers or to a people instead of having that one on one communion with God. And as we've said before, the job of the ministry is not to get you connected to them. The job of the ministry is to help you get a connection to Christ. Amen. And to have a relationship with Christ in its highest form where you have a, a an experience of communication, of communion with God on a consistent basis. And this was being restored under this time uh, that God's people uh, could get back to the altar, the restoration of the altar and get back to a place where they could consecrate to God and have communion uh, with God. We want to deal with now in the gospel day, the necessity of. The necessity of the altar. And in order to restore the church to the primitive glory, it must include the altar of sacrifice. There is no church of God without the altar. There is no church of God without sanctification. Uh, Lord willing, in the next Bible study, uh, we would like to share some quotes of some of the six seal brethren and how they, they discuss this very thing of how sanctification is absolutely vital. It is absolutely necessity for the church of God. There would not have been a church of God reformation in 1880. There would not have been a sixth seal if it was not for the message of sanctification. And anyone who stands up in a pulpit and preaches a heresy such as one cleansing is not a prophet of God and does not have the understanding of the message. That is absolute heresy. Amen. To promote that is wrong. It's in, it's not biblical. Its foundation is not correct. Amen. And God has never blessed that message and God will never bless that message. Amen. It will take the altar of uh, of of consecration, sanctification, the infilling of the Holy Ghost in order to produce the glory of the church of God. Solomon sold out on the altar before God can endorse it. And we we'll go back to the temple and then the dedication, I believe it's at 120,000 sheep. Uh, and that was just sheep that were sacrificed that day. Amen. And oxen and so on. There was a complete and total selling out. I'll take you back to the upper room. Amen. Where the apostles were selling out before God ever endorsed. Amen. Th that temple or that uh, tabernacle uh, in Solomon's time and before God ever set the morning time church going. Amen. They had to sell out and get back to the altar and a sacrifice needed to be made at that altar and a response from God needs to come at the altar. The fire needs to fall. The fire fell at the dedication uh, when Solomon prayed and the fire fell on the day of Pentecost. And there is not a people of God. There is not a real people of God where there is not an altar. Now, there might be a lack of understanding, and that's why it is so vital and it is so important to walk in light because God is faithful to give light. And that's what happened to Luther and his contemporaries or those that came after him. Amen. They did not walk in the light and did not go on into that experience of sanctification and herald that message as God would have wanted them to. Amen. They got caught up in the flesh. Amen. And as a result, they ceased to be the people of God. And that star fell. And those people lost their experiences. Uh, those ones in that time lost their experience with, experiences with God. Amen. That corruption sat in, set in. Amen. And they no longer uh, were the people of God. Amen. The people of God spent a long time in Babylon. Amen. Now they're beginning to return, but they didn't just come back and start setting up the temple. No, they restored the altar. Amen. And so before we see the church of God restored uh, in 1880, around that time, amen, Brother Wesley and his contemporaries came and brought the truth on sanctification. They began uh, by not just returning to Israel, amen, but by building an altar. It's not good enough to just decry Catholicism. Many people today are content that they can uh, seize the wrong and false religion or this, that, and the other, amen, but it's more than that. We have to walk in the light, and the light of sanctification is a vital component. Let's go to Revelation chapter 8. Look at this parallel a little more as we move on through this study. Revelation chapter 8, verse number 12. And the fourth angel sounded. A fourth angel sounded. So we're moving away from the third trumpet. And we're looking at this fourth angel, which also sounded under Protestantism. Amen. The third, fourth, and fifth angel sounded during the Protestant era. 
And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten. The third part of the sun was smitten. Amen. We want to deal uh, with that. those words, the sun was smitten. We know that if we were to go back uh, and study Jewish history, the Jewish day starts at about 6 p.m., starts in the evening. And we could even see that if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, uh, the evening preceded the morning. And so if we were to uh, look at this in a dispensational way, Way. Amen. We know that the Old Testament or came prior to the New Testament. The Old Testament came first, and we recognize that as the moon. Amen. And then we characterize the sun as the light of the New Testament, that the sun came later. And we could show that point. We wanted to go to John chapter 1, verse number 9, talks about uh, that Christ was the light, the, the true light, that lighteth, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Um, Malachi 4.2 talks about the son of righteousness coming. Uh, so that's that's coming following the Old Testament. Uh, Revelation uh, chapter 22 talks about Christ being the bright and morning star. So we know that the New Testament followed uh, the old. And so this we're talking about is that the third part of the sun was smitten or that one third of the light did not shine during this time all right we know that truth has three parts so with the third part of the sun being smitten during this time means one third of the light was not shining under this ministry and the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars so as the third part of them was darkened so we know that truth has three parts and so under this ministry one third uh, was not in operation and so the day shown not for a third part of it and the night likewise. So we see a mixed condition under this ministry. We don't see a, a completely dark day. The, you know, the sun went down at noon in the dark ages. We, it's not it's not completely black, but it's not completely light either. Uh, let's go to Mark chapter four, please. Mark chapter four. So we know the uh, um, truth is three parts, justification, sanctification, and the unity of God's people. And we want to show an illustration of this in the fourth chapter of Mark. Um, through the teachings of Christ. And just one verse here we want to grab. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. First the blade, sanctification. Then the ear, sorry, first the blade, justification. Then the ear, sanctification. After that, the full corn in the ear the wesleyan era had two parts wesley declared two-thirds of it he declared the message of justification and he declares the message of entire sanctification and we don't have time to prove all of this historically tonight but if you study wesley he he preached sanctification as a definite cleansing he preached that this experience was subsequent to justification. So he did not preach that you get saved and sanctified at the same time. And so this, and I'm not, when I speak of Wesley, I'm not just talking about John Wesley, but that ministry and that time, they began to herald the message of justification and many received the experience of a definite infilling of the Holy Ghost. Under this message, souls begin to die out to sin and self and so two-thirds of the light is shining and we want to deal a little bit with protestantism tonight because unfortunately the full light was not shining and we don't have time to get into every element of protestantism we could go on into revelation chapter 9 and talk about the smoke of the pit and amen the uh the lack of foundation and amen and, and, and opening up the keys of the bottomless pit and all that let out and we might talk about that next week but we want to deal a little bit with the pale horse tonight, and then we should be about done here, Lord willing. Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. We want to deal with Protestantism. Again, under the fourth trumpet angel, starts off two-thirds of the light shining. Amen. But the full light's not shining, so we have a mixed condition. And that is the earmark of Protestantism. Revelation chapter 6, let's talk a little bit about this pale horse. Verse number 7, And when he had opened the fourth seal, 
I heard the voice of the fourth beast. And that fourth beast really, that word beast in Revelation should say uh, living creatures. Um, and talking about the fourth living creature, uh, which is uh, depicted as an eagle. And this fourth voice of the fourth beast uh, or fourth living creature it represents the redeemed of all ages. And Revelation 4, 7, we could go back and study out the, the redeemed of all ages and the four living creatures. Uh, but during this time, um, the, the fourth voice, the voice of the fourth beast is an eagle. It's portrayed as an eagle. We'll talk a little bit more about why uh, it was portrayed as an eagle as we go a little further on into this study. But he said, and when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. And so we're going to do our best to cover as much as we can here. But we know that horses, as we did in a previous study, horses represent militant spirits. The pale horse is quite deceptive. It is the closest resemblance uh, to the white horse. It is a mixture of light and darkness or a mixture of truth and error. And um, Zechariah chapter 6, please. Zechariah chapter 6. just want to make a reference here to the horses. And verse number... Three, and in the third chariot, white horses, and in the fourth chariot, grizzled and bay. And that grizzled and bay means uh, spotted horses, a white horse with some spots on it. Uh, bay is a strong color, no stronger color than white. Grizzled means spotted. And so this is not a depiction of the true church of God. This is a depiction of a mixed condition, a mixed condition, not completely light, not completely dark. And there's a deception in that because some people feel, well, they got some light. Well, there's, there's some truth in it, uh, but wherever there's error, there's danger. Ephesians 5.27 talks about uh, the church being without spot and wrinkle. James 1.27 talks about the church being unspotted from the world. Jude verses 10 and verse 12 talks about spots in your feasts of charity. Spots are no good. Amen. There cannot be, we, we cannot settle for a mixing of truth and error. That's what produces Protestantism. That's what produces a church that is not improved of God. Amen. A little light and a little error will cause great damage because the little error uh, will cause uh, some big problems. The Bible says a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Spots are symbols of sin and worldliness. And so Protestantism is a spirit of compromise. Uh, this was at work. The spirit uh, came out, out of through the dark ages, through Catholicism, but it produced uh, it produced Protestantism. The Roman Catholic Church could not produce spiritual life. Amen. But the deception is that the pale horse, there was enough truth to get saved. Amen. There was enough truth to even get sanctified. But then they killed with the very sword that was supposed to give them life. If we went back to Revelation chapter 6 where we're studying about the pale horse. The very thing that was given the life, they used it to kill folks with. And, and, and we're speaking in a spiritual sense here, of course. Amen. He said, it says, and I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell follow with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword. To kill with the sword. Meaning, get experience of salvation, get experience of sanctification, but then they want you to hook up with one of their denominations. Amen. Or become a member of their church. Amen. And thus the very spirit of God that led one to get saved and the very spirit of God led one to get sanctified. And then all of a sudden they want man to intervene and you hold to our creeds and get baptized and sign a card or become a member of our church. Amen. And all of a sudden they want you to follow uh, man-made creeds. And so the very spirituality uh, that God him say, the very spirit that God him say, God does not continue to lead people and they end up dying in these systems of men. Amen. These beasts of the earth, it, as it talks about Revelation 6, verse number 8, at the end it says, and with beasts of the earth or systems of the religion of the earth and the earth we know represents protestantism because let's go over to revelation chapter 13 and verse number 11 it says and beheld another beast coming up out of the earth amen. and this is protestantism and then the catholic came up out of the sea 
And the Protestant beast came up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, looked like a lamb. And he spake as a dragon. He exerciseth all the power of the first beast. And basically, Protestantism, amen, is Roman Catholicism in another garb. Amen. And Roman Catholicism is nothing more than paganism in another gar garb. It's anti-Christ and it's anti-God. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed out of the minds of men. Nothing more than paganism in another form. Amen. This thing came up out of the minds of men, did not come out of the spirit of God and Protestantism. Amen. While they had enough gospel to get people saved and sanctified. Amen. They fell prey to the evils of sectarianism. Joel chapter two, verse number two. We won't turn there. Amen. But talks about. Amen. The dark and cloudy day. Amen. A day. Amen. That was not uh, that was not fully bright, but was not fully dark either. The devil just changed his clothes and went and appeared as a lamb. Amen. But and the heart of it was nothing more than just another system uh, that was not of God. God's sheep hear his voice. Doesn't matter what it looks like. Amen. You need to be able to hear the voice of God. There are things that can appear like a lamb. It can appear like it's good. It can appear like it's truth. But the true people of God should be able to distinguish truth from error because they should be so uh, used to the voice of God. So accustomed to the voice of God. God's sheep will not follow a system. God's sheep will not follow men. They will not follow appearances. They will follow the voice. Amen. Follow the voice of God. He said, my sheep hear my voice. It doesn't matter if you look like a lamb. I want to know what the message is. I want to hear what you're preaching. I want to hear what you're saying. Amen. Because you can look like a lamb and speak like a dragon and speak that which is not of God. Speak that which is not under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And so if we are going to be the people of God, we are responsible for what we allow ourselves to be up under. Amen. And we are obligated to make sure that what we are up under is the voice of Jesus Christ, that Christ is the head of the church, that whatever gets said across the pulpit, amen, is the Lamb of God, is the voice of the Lamb. Amen. We should be able to recognize it. Amen. And anything uh, that does not line up to the word of God and to the spirit of God, it is error and it should be rejected. Amen. And so thank God we want to get to the to the good part here. In just a moment, there were some people, amen, that were yearning and longing for, to be free uh, from that system of Protestantism. Amen. This cloudy condition, amen, this confusing condition, it holds people. It holds people in confusion. It holds them in deception sometimes. Amen. And it does not, it holds the true people of God in bondage. In Zechariah 14, 6, it also talks about that day, amen, where uh, it is not, and not completely clear. It's a cloudy day or a mixed atmosphere. There's some truth, but there's also some things that just aren't right. Amen. And thank God there were some people, amen, that were tired of that condition. To finish up this thought, it says that he that sat on this beast had power. Amen. Had power over here. Uh, let's go back to Revelation, please. Chapter six. And we'll finish up this thought and then we'll close out here. Revelation chapter six. It says, and power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger. People are starving for truth. Amen. People starving for truth. Amen. To kill with the sword and with hunger and with death. And you'll lose out with God being up under these conditions. Amen. It produces death. That's what a mixed condition will do. That's what the very spirit of Protestantism will do. It will kill the spirituality right out of people. Amen. We'll starve them to death. Amen. They'll use the word of God, but amen. They won't feed the people with it. Amen. They end up killing people with it. Oh, they'll have their little scriptures and their amen recitation and amen. Get up and say a few words in the pulpit, but they don't have anything to really feed the people of God with. Oh, they'll still open the Bible. They'll still open the Bible and say a few words, but there is nothing. There's no spiritual life down there. Amen. And in the name of religion, they'll kill people. Amen. And in the, and the end result of it is death. Amen. And the people... Uh, unfortunately, amen, people will unfortunately end up losing out with God, amen, all the while sitting in a church pew, starved out to death, amen. It says, 
he that sat on him to kill with the sword. Amen. Oh, they still they'll they'll open the Bible, they'll say a few words, they'll they'll preach a few things here and there. Amen. But there's nothing really to feed the soul. Amen. Jeremiah 3 15. He said, I will give you pastors, amen, that shall feed you. Amen. But there's a lot of places in the land today where the preacher's getting up in the pulpit, but there is no real spiritual substance to the message, and people are not uh, having the 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 uh, not living a life uh, where the spirit is uh, giving them life. Amen. In fact, they're dying in the pews. Amen. They're being killed at this in the pews. Amen. And there's a lot of lifeless, dead religious formality going on across the land today, all in the name of religion. Amen. Where people are not really being fed. Amen. The word of God. As we read in Ezra chapter three, verse number six, that the foundation was not yet laid. And it is the same so same way in the gospel day where one third of the light did not shine. Protestantism, there was a little light shining. Amen. There was two thirds light shining, but it was a mixed condition of light and darkness. And we call that the cloudy day. Amen. But yet there were some souls that were longing for something to change. Amen. They were longing for God's people to come together. Let's go to Revelation 6. And we'll close out here. And verse number nine, under the message of Wesley and under that two thirds light, there were some people that died out to sin and self. It says in verse number nine, and when he had opened the fifth seal, the fifth seal took place under the Protestant era. We'll deal a little more with this next time. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. Many times, for some reason, this scripture has been used to refer to the martyrs. Uh, unfortunately, the timing would be very off in trying to apply this scripture to the martyr. To the martyrs amen because when they're really when we would study this historically we would not see there being anyone really being persecuted to be a christian and being a martyr for the sake of christ but this is talking about a people that got up under the altar and died out to sin and self i saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of god meaning they died out to sin they died out to self amen for the for the advancement of the word of god and for the testimony which they held and they cried with a loud voice or they prayed you know we could show you some scriptures tonight uh where crying and praying go hand in hand let's go actually go back real quick to hebrews chapter 3 to show just hebrews 13 just to show this is not speaking of martyrdom but real consecration uh sorry we'll just cover this in real quickly we're almost done hebrews 13 verse number eight jesus christ the same yesterday and today and forever be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrine for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Amen. This is talking about a sacrifice being done under the altar. Jesus Christ being the altar. People dying out to self. Amen. And getting a real experience of consecration and sanctification. Getting up underneath the altar. Amen. And living for Christ. If Christ is the altar, then we are to be under Christ and have sub submission to Christ. All right. Revelation chapter 6, going back to verse number 10. And they cried with a loud voice or a figurative expression of prayer. And look up 1 Kings 8.28. 2 Chronicles 6, 19 and Psalm 39, 12. And you'll see uh, this goes hand in hand. Prayer, uh, hear my prayer, O Lord, and uh, in incline thine ear unto my cry. Uh, those verses go hand in hand. Amen. They cried with a loud voice or prayed with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? The Bible says, and white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Meaning there was a time to come, amen, where other people could get to this experience of being sold out to God, get this experience of sanctification. It says slain or died out. Amen. That they should rest, rest from sin and be crucified from Christ. They're asking, how long? 
How long? Yearning for true unity, yearning for the people of God to come together. And they needed others to find a place where they could die out. And as we said at the beginning, amen, the six seal brethren probably preached about sanctification more than they ever did about the unity of God's people because the message to come out of her, my people, depended upon the truth and light of sanctification. And God did answer their prayers in the sixth seal. And John Wesley, there's a quote here that I would like to share that shows this yearning for unity, shows this yearning for people to be able to come together, amen, on the experience of the blood of Jesus Christ perfecting them uh, in the work of sanctification. He, re he says this, would to God, this is in the 1700s, would to God that all the party names and unscriptural phrases and forms which have divided the Christian world were forgot and that we might all agree to sit down together as humble, loving disciples at the feet of our common master to hear his word, to imbibe his spirit and to transcribe his life in our own. Wesley was looking for a day when the denominational ties would be severed, when the party names would be forgotten and put aside and that the people of God could come together not divided up by sectarianism, not divided up by denominationalism and groups and this fellowship and that fellowship, but that they could come together on the word of God, amen, to hear his word, to imbibe his spirit and to transcribe his life in our own. Wesley was yearning and longing and looking for that day. And it was not to be in their time. Amen. They prayed for it. Amen. They sought God for it. Amen. But he said, uh, rest, rest, a while, amen, rest in Christ, crucify with Christ, and the day will come, amen, where that, where there will be places, amen, where, that, where the people of God can come together and also obtain uh, that same experience of sanctification. And so even under Wesley, while there was some good things done, amen, there was some light that was restored, amen, the temple was not yet built, and complete restoration had not been obtained. And that's as far as we'll go tonight. We'll wrap it up there, talking about the restoration of the altar. We do thank you for your kind attention to the word of God tonight. Trust it was a blessing. Pray that it was. And we ask that God bless each and every one of you. If there's any questions or comments at any time, uh, you're at liberty to reach out to us or um, even make them known uh, in the chat box and so on. Um, but we will, uh, we will continue uh, to make ourselves available to any that may uh, need to reach out. May God bless you tonight.